you know, eventually there are some people who the cities that they come from are part of their makeup, the deserts, the valleys. Maybe we even have our own parents like that. Maybe you're like that. You, your hometown has, been an inc- has had an incredible effect on shaping you. And just like you can't tell the story of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, without telling the story of Mecca, and you can't tell the story of Musa السلام, without telling the story of Bani Israel in Egypt, you can't tell the story of Maryam without telling the story of Al-Aqsa. And Bani Israel in Jerusalem starts, for our purposes at least, with Musa السلام. People restrict Musa's mission to calling Fir'aun to Tawheed, that he was sent to Fir'aun to call him to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a part of his mission. His mission was for sure to call Fir'aun to Islam, but that wasn't the only part of his mission. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Musa alayhi salam and Harun went to Fir'aun and they said, Inna rasula rabbika. We are the messengers of your Lord. فَأَرْسِلْ مَعَنَا بَنِي Israel. So send with us Bani Israel. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that they said, فَأْتِيَا فِرْعَوْنَ فَقُولَا إِنَّا رَسُولُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also sends them saying, go to Fir'aun and say, we are the messengers of the Lord of the worlds. And أَرْسِلْ مَعَنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ Send with us, children of Israel. And so Musa alayhi salam's mission is to call the Egyptians to Islam, but also to lead Bani Israel out of Egypt. That is part and parcel of his mission. And so when he is able to actually fulfill that and take them out of Egypt and then get them all the way to Jerusalem because that was the mission, to take them to Al-Ard al-Muqaddas, to take them to the Blessed Land. And then Bani Israel, after they go through all of that with Musa alayhi salam, they say, nope, we're going to sit right here. Go, we finally reached the destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, go and you will win. And they're like, nope, you and your Lord go fight. We're going to sit right here. So then you understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would punish them after he has brought them out of Egypt. Okay, so y'all don't want to, you, you don't want to take the last three steps into the city? Then you deserve to go and wander in the desert for 40 years. And that's what they did. They wandered in the desert for 40 years and Musa alayhi salam himself was not able to enter into Jerusalem. And when he was uh, about to die, he simply asked that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place him or that he die a stone's throw away from Jerusalem. And so he is as close as he can possibly be to Al Ard al Muqaddasa, even though he doesn't enter it. And then after that, 40 years go by, and a generation that's actually deserving of entering into Jerusalem and conquering the city enters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them tawfiq. And then, of course, David and Solomon, two mighty prophetic kings, kings who are prophets, prophets who are kings, even better, are uh, usher in the golden age for Bani Israel. And Sulaiman alayhi salam, after the death of his father, Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman is this magnificent king who has a kingdom the likes of which no one ever has had. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam actually tells us in a powerful hadith in Ibn Majah, an amazing hadith in Ibn Majah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam says that Sulaiman, when he finished completing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, when he built Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three things. And this is a hadith that actually isn't very popular in the Muslim world. When people talk about the virtues of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, everybody knows the virtues of Al-Haram and, 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 and Makki. People know the, haram, the, the virtues of Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. But when you talk about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, all people know is that I, I think it's like worth 500 prayers somewhere else, and that's even controversial. The more authentic hadith is that it's worth 250, and of course, Masjid al is 1,000, and Al Masjid al Haram in Mecca is 100,000. But there's something else also that the Prophet mentioned that's amazing. He said that when Sulaiman built Al Masjid al Aqsa, he made dua for three things. What were those three things? Number one, he says, Hukman a judgment that is congruent, that is synonymous with Allah's judgment in the heavens. That was Sulaiman judges between two people on earth, that it be that it be in harmony with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment in the heavens. That's number one. Number two, a kingdom the likes that which no one will ever have after him. That's number two. And number three, that nobody intends to go to Al Masjid Al Aqsa for the purpose of praying in it, except that they leave that masjid like the day their mother gave birth to them. That when you walk into a Masjid Al-Aqsa and the only reason you're there is to pray and then you leave, all of your sins are forgiven. The Prophet ﷺ says, as for the first two, he was given. And I hope that he was given the third as well. So we don't have finality on the third. 
That's the reason why most people haven't heard of it. Because if it was finalized, if the Prophet ﷺ had said, yes, that was also given to him, then everybody would be going and praying in Masjid Al-Aqsa all the time. But the Prophet ﷺ says, as for the first two, he was given. And I hope that he was given the third. But there's also something really interesting with regards to Sulaiman. Sulaiman, also he says in Surah Sat, I mean, it's not just quoted in this hadith, but it's quoted in Surah Sat where Sulaiman alayhi salam, he says, he says, my Lord, forgive me and give me a dominion the likes of which no one will ever have after me. Problem that gets posed is that there's no archaeological evidence of Sulaiman's kingdom existing up until now. And this, is, this has caused people a lot of, you know, conflict. Like, how do, you, how do you explain this incredible king with all of this wealth that's being described. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Queen of Sheba coming to the palace of Sulaiman and there's there she even she's walking on glass and she thinks that there's she thinks she's about to walk on water or walk in water because it's it's the glass is so pristine, it's so clear, and there's water underneath it. Like it's talking about a great kingdom and there's nothing to indicate its existence. So are, are David and Solomon even real? Are these imaginary kings? And I was reading one of the historians of Palestine, one of the modern historians, Dr. Abdullah al Mabruk. He was commenting on this and he said, according to him and according to, you know, he quoted some, some uh, modern mufassirin, he said, it's actually solved in the Quran. This puzzle is solved in the Quran. Sulaiman salam, when he says and makes dua for the kingdom, he says, Oh my Lord, forgive me, wahabli, and gift me a kingdom la yanbaghi li ahadi min ba'di. That does not yanbaghi. What does yanbaghi mean? Yanbaghi, the problem with translating, of course, always, is that you might have a word that has like seven connotations, seven different meanings, and you have to pick one of them to translate. So the way that we normally translate yanbaghi is, that is not, uh, grant me a kingdom, the likes that which no one will ever have after me. So that's like, that's like a satisfactory one manifestation of it. But yanbaghi also means that is not going to be befitting for anybody else after me. Grant me a kingdom the likes that will not be accessible to anybody after me. Accessible is too much, but befitting. It's not befitting for anyone. But that's what I mean. That's where I'm taking this, is that Sulaiman is making a dua that could be understood as saying, grant me a kingdom the likes that no one will have access to after me. And so then it becomes a kingdom that vanishes with his death. It becomes structures that don't exist after Sulaiman passes away. It becomes something that you're not going to find artifacts for a thousand years later. And this becomes something that is infused in the Quranic language. It becomes infused in the Quranic wording. But the time that Maryam's mother is existing in is far from the time of kings and prophets. It's a time of prophets, but since then, the Babylonians had taken over, and the Greeks then came after them, and now the Romans were occupying the city since around 64 or 65 before Christ, the Romans had taken over. The Prophet Sallallahu describes Bani Israel in the Hadith in Sahih Muslim, and he says that Bani Israel used to be governed by their prophets. Every time a prophet died, another was sent. And the Prophet Sallallahu comments and he says, but I'm the last, there is no prophet after me. But I want you to get the image of Bani Israel even as they've been expelled from Jerusalem by the Babylonians and they got taken to Babylon and even as they came back and even as the Greeks took over and even as the Romans took over, they, the prophets had a very limited role. For example, the Romans, they allowed them, take care of your temple, no problem. Take care of your temple. Zechariah alayhi salam and all of those, I mean, Zechariah was alive and Maryam's mother was alive when the Romans took over. So if it's 60 BC, that means that they witnessed it because they were old when they gave birth to their children. And so Maryam السلام, must have been born maybe uh, 15 years or 16 years or uh, maybe yeah, 15 years or 16 years before Christ, right? According to her age. And so they witness all of this and they see this incredible change in their city and they see the corruption of their people. And when you, 
when you see that they realize that they're at the end of this tunnel, that Bani Israel's situation looks literally seems like it's worse than it's ever been before. Now you get a sense of the desperation that they had, the desperation in the language that they use in the Quran. Zakaria alayhi salam whispering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me an heir. Like Zakaria is not whispering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me an heir because he wants anyone to inherit money from him. Of course not, he's a prophet. But at the same time, he sees that nobody's taking up this mantle and he needs help. There needs to be somebody else. There needs to be another prophet. And Maryam salam's mother is offering her child to be in the service of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Like it's surrounded by, it's occupied by the Romans. This is an occupied land. And, and, and she wants somebody in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And she's offering her child to be in, like these are the these are the strongholds of iman left in that city, and she's offering her child. And guess what? She has a daughter, and she still offers her child. That's her religiosity, her brilliance, but also desperate times, also desperate times. And so she offers her child, and she goes and she delivers that child to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa anyway, even though it's a girl. And so this is the world that Maryam Ali Salam came into. It's a it's a world of Roman soldiers, it's a world where the light of prophethood is at its end. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides that Bani Israel, Allah provides Bani Israel that's been so corrupted. Allah provides Bani Israel with two last prophets, Yahya and Isa, the two cousins. The mother of Maryam is hoping to have a child to be a caretaker of the masjid. But instead of being the mother of the caretaker, she would be the grandmother of two prophets, Yahya and Isa. And their arrival together would be the last line of prophethood for that entire community. Whatever happens to them of goodness to Bani Israel, then that's good for them. And whatever happens to them of evil, then that's the end for Bani Israel.